Well, good evening. I trust you're doing well in your homes there tonight. Our prayers are with you, and I trust that you're taking advantage of this time as well. I know it's difficult, but enjoy the time with family. We uh, often find ourselves thinking, oh, I wished I had more time. Now some of us are forced to uh, be in a situation where we have time with the family. And so take advantage of that. Uh, make it a profitable time. Spend time with one another. And we know, again, I reiterate what I've said before, this too will pass. We must be positive and keep our eyes on the Lord. But if you would tonight, turn with me to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, and I would like to read uh, starting at verse 5 down through verse 11. Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Father, we do pray tonight as we attempt to exalt your name and lift your name up, God, that we would honor and glorify you in all that's said and done here. I do pray that you would be near each and every family right now. Lord, encourage their hearts. Help them keep their eyes upon you. And though we may not know the reasons nor have the answers for the question why, may we just trust you, Lord. Now you have your way here as we look into thy word. Fill me with thy power. Use me for your glory. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Names are a very interesting thing. And tonight, as we get into the next message on the uh, great hymns of the faith, we're going to be looking at this hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. And again, don't worry, I will not sing it. But I would like to read uh, just the words and um, let you think about these, these words of this Precious name, Jesus. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to him all majesty ascribe, and crown him Lord of all. All that yonder sacred throng, we at his feet may fall, will join the everlasting song, and crown him Lord of all. Jesus' name. Now think of it. How interesting names are. You and I could be standing in a great crowd. Well, we won't be doing that uh, anytime soon. But you know how it is when we, if we were in a great crowd of people and someone was to mention our name, oh, our ears would prick up immediately. We would hear our name over all the noise and the bustle of that crowd. A name can compel friends and family members to travel great distances. In fact, right here, many a times at the church, I've had people that have visited this cemetery, people from all over America have come looking up a name of their ancestor. And then they'll find that name carved in a stone. They'll rub their fingers over it. Or they'll take paper and they'll trace over it. Much like they do at memorials like this, the Vietnam Memorial in, in D.C. And they will find that name and all oh, how they cherish that name. That it's very precious to them. A very valuable thing. And our names are precious to us. I mean, 
So much of our identity is caught up in the letters that form our name. And we value our names, and that's why parents go to great lengths to, to uh, choose uh, the right name for their child. And one psychologist studied that the names of uh, 15,000 juvenile delinquents, and he discovered that those with odd names, those with embarrassing names, were in trouble four times as much as kids who had more traditional or accepted names. Maybe that's why you're in trouble uh, if you have one of those unusual names. That reminds me, speaking of embarrassing names, I, I read a story about a couple whose little girl uh, was named Femily, like Emily, just with an F in front of it. And someone asked them how they came to choose such an unusual name for their little girl. And they replied, oh, well, we didn't actually choose the name. The nurses did. You see, we, when we were in the hospital, they brought her to us. And the first time that we saw her, their, the name was written uh, above her head on, and on her little wristband, Femily Jones. Femily Jones. And we decided, boy, we really like that name. So they decided to name their little girl Femily. Then the person asked, so how do you spell Femily? And the mother said, just like it sounds, F-E-M-A-L-E, -E, Femily. <laughs> well, the significance of a name is nothing new. The Bible tells us over and over again, we see that there's great significance around the names of the individuals there in the Bible. And many times when someone is, someone's name is mentioned in the Bible, they'll even give a definition of that name in the Word of God and what that name means. Many times the, the characters in the Bible actually um, take on the characteristics or they they fit the name that they have been given. They live up to the meaning of their names. We're not going to take the time to go through all those names in the Bible, but I think it's interesting to note that when the time was finally right for God to send his only begotten son to this world, when it was when Jesus Christ took upon himself the flesh of mankind, he did not God, that is, did not leave the naming of his son up to Joseph and Mary. No, God exercised his privilege as the heavenly father and chose a name for his son. He even sent an angel to make sure that Mary and Joseph gave him that name that he had selected. You know, I'm sure you can remember the words of of uh, the, these uh, texts that oftentimes we read it around Christmas time, Matthew 1 21, where the angel said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, this hymn that we're going to be looking at tonight is just a, a, a wonderful hymn. I think it's an encouraging hymn uh, and message that we can. Uh, here tonight, and it'll encourage us in our faith. But um, it's all about the name of Jesus. It first appeared in November 1799 in a periodical called the Gospel Magazine. The author of this hymn was Reverend Edward Perronet. His uh, grandparents had fled Catholic France, going first to Switzerland, then to England. Edward's father had become a vicar in the Anglican Church, and Edward followed his father's footsteps. For several years, this hymn, this hymn writer was closely allied and connected with John Wesley and the whole Wesley uh, family. And he traveled with them. Eventually, though, they broke with the Wesleys over uh, various uh, Methodist policies. And the in fact, the break was so strong that John Wesley... Um, would not, uh, or he excluded, Paranet's uh, hymns from the Methodist hymnal. Edward went off to uh, pastor a small independent church in Canterbury, where he died January the 22nd, 1792, seven years before this hymn 
uh, appeared in print. Listen to his last words, this great hymn writer. Glory to God in the height of his divinity. Glory to God in the depth of his humanity. Glory to God in his all-sufficiency. Into his hands I commend my spirit. Now those are some powerful last words. And they are the kind of words that we would expect from such a great hymn writer uh, like this. Now as I said, the subject of this song, the subject of my message tonight is Jesus Christ. And, and I want to uh, just say in here, a lot of the outline uh, is not original. In fact, I want to give credit where credit is due. I, I'm indebted to Dr. David Jeremiah for much of the outline of this message. But uh, let's just get right into it. First of all, concerning the name of Jesus, we, uh, we should note that the name of Jesus, it is an esteemed name, an esteemed name. Bernard of Clairvaux once wrote, No voice can sing, nor heart can frame, nor can the memory find a sweeter sound than thy blessed name, O Savior of mankind. And Bernard was expressing the opinion of literally millions of people, uh, billions, I would have to say, over the years, who would agree that we all love the name Jesus. Did you know that in the Gospels, Christ is called by that particular name over 500 times? And according to the concordance, the name Jesus appears a total of 1,276 times there in the New Testament alone. To me, this says that of all the names, that of all the titles that are given to Christ, the one most loved by his followers is that simple name, Jesus. The scripture isn't the only place where we find the name Jesus to be highly esteemed. If we were to glance through um, our hymn book tonight, you would find many songs in this hymn book that um, the theme of those songs or the, the whole uh, thought of that song is Jesus Christ. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds. Take the name of Jesus with you. Blessed be the name. There is a name I love to hear. And Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And of course, this song we're looking at tonight, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Well, if we were to list all the songs, all the choruses that had the name of Jesus as its theme, we would be here all night, and it would be a very large book. And the reason this is true is because this is a name that is still loved. And uh, this, this leads me to the second thing about the name of Jesus Christ. It is an easy name, an easy name. I mean, it's not hard to pronounce. It's not hard to spell. And it is easy to say and remember. It's only got two syllables, just five letters, spelled just like it sounds. It is an easy name. By the way, there's some unusual names in the Bible. I know you would agree. Some that we have a hard time pronouncing. There is a man in the Bible named Adon. I, I was trying to pronounce this for quite some time. Adonai Vizek. Adonai Vizek. And uh, in the Old Testament, the book of Judges. Aren't you glad that God didn't choose Abinai Bezek, or however it's pronounced? Aren't you glad he didn't choose that name for his son? Can you imagine this hymn, All Hail the Power of Abinai Zek, Let Angels Prostrate Fall? Oh my, that song wouldn't be very popular then. And neither would other hymns, like, Oh, how I love Abinai Bezek. And uh, others. And, and, and aren't you glad that it's just the name Jesus? You see, the name Jesus, the simple name Jesus, it is so easy to pronounce. In fact, it's almost pronounced the same way in every language around the world. I can remember being in South America, though I could not understand the language as I was in those gatherings in the in the jungles of South America and as they sang those hymns 
But one word that I always caught was the name Jesus. I, of course, Mildred being Chinese, I also, uh, when the conversation would be in the Chinese language, but when the name Jesus was mentioned, I could tell, I could hear it. I knew they were talking about Jesus. Oh, Jesus is a universal name. And there's no other name like it. Uh, and perhaps because of its simplicity, this name has become a, a universal symbol of God's love for mankind. Another thing, it's a name that is simple enough for even a small child to learn. If you have ever taught a Sunday school class, it gets to the place, it seems like you ask a question, who created the heavens and the earth? And a little Johnny will raise his hand and say, Jesus, who wrote the Bible? Jesus, who died for us? Jesus. Oh, how quickly they learn that simple name, Jesus. You know, I think it's very significant that God chose an easy name. Perhaps he was trying to let us know that we would no longer be under that complicated law of the Old Testament, and that now we find ourselves under a new law, a new a period of grace, and so it, it's just simple. We, we don't have to go through all the formalities of the sacrificing of animals. Just simply call out the name of Jesus for salvation. Jesus, save me. Think about those three words. Get the right number up here. Those three words. Jesus, save me. How many, how many multitudes of people have come to Christ with saying some words similar to that? How many thousands of times when this must have happened throughout the centuries and, and as people knew their life was about to end, maybe someone was drowning or someone saw a car coming across that center line right for them. Or the World uh, uh, Trade uh, Center towers as they were collapsing around them. Or, or maybe a soldier dying on the battlefield. And in those last moments of life upon this earth, maybe they cried out, oh, Jesus, save me. And in many of those prayers, it was not just a prayer for saving their physical life, but for saving their soul. And when they called out for Jesus Christ to save their soul, you know what happened? He did. He did. That simple name was the key to where they are, uh, those individuals who called on him, it's the key to where they are now spending eternity because of of calling out to Jesus. Acts 2, 21 says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, praise God for that simple word, whosoever. That includes you, that includes me, that includes everyone. So Jesus is an esteemed name, and it's an easy name. And then thirdly, it's also an enduring name, an enduring name. You realize that even though our Lord was born in obscurity over 2,000 years ago, even though he died like a criminal at the age of 33, and even though he ministered only 33, or excuse me, not 33, but only three years, and even though his ministry was relatively in a secluded uh, place on this planet, do you realize that in spite of all those things, his name is still the most well-known name in all of history. The great libraries of the world have entire walls filled with books written about Jesus. Jesus' face and his name have been on the cover of Life, Time, Newsweek, and National Geographic magazines more, more than any other person on this planet. Here are a, are a few exa uh, samples. Whenever uh, public opinion polls are taken, and when they ask who is the most admired man in history, inevitably the most uh, uh, the name that is given more often than any other is the name Jesus Christ. Emperors have tried to destroy his name, 
philosophies had tried to stamp the name of Jesus out. Tyrants have tried to wash it from the face of the earth with the blood of those very individuals who proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. And yet, Jesus still stands. Napoleon once said, I search in vain in history to find the similar uh, to find the similar to Jesus Christ, or anything which can approach the gospel. Nations pass away, thrones are crumble, but the church of Jesus remains. It is indeed an enduring name. In fact, as Paul says in our text in the book of Philippians, the name of Jesus will endure uh, until the end of time. And on this earth, it will endure not just to the end of time, it will endure forever. When that final day dawns, when, as it says here, every knee, every tongue, every tongue that has ever uttered a sound, every single voice of all of, the, the, of Adam's race, they will all, mightily join together as one great chorus to proclaim the name of Jesus. So the name of Jesus, it is esteemed. The name of Jesus, thank God, it is easy. And it is enduring. It will last forever. And then another thing about the name of Jesus, it is an exclusive name. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You know, a lot of people hold the opinion of that all religions are really the same. And they are saying they're all basically equal, that there is no exclusive way to heaven. And that's what a lot of people believe in this world today. However, anyone who is an honest student of the word of God Anyone who takes time to actually study uh, uh, all through the Word of God, the things that Jesus said, would know that that kind of thinking is absolutely wrong. You see, it, the best proof text is in a verse that I often share, John 14, 6, where Jesus said, I am the way, the way, the only way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus said right there emphatically, clearly, I, Jesus said this, I am the way. Now, I could cite tons of other verses, but suffice it to say that according to the book of books, according to the word of God, Jesus is the only way, the only way to God. He's the only son of God. He's the only sinless man, and, and therefore the only one who could die for the sins of all of mankind. That's the truth, and truth, by its very nature, is exclusive. And that leads me to refer to another uncomfortable thought or truth. Maybe it's uh, an unpopular truth, and here it is. All people are by nature and by choice sinners. That's right. That's what the Bible declares. And not only that does it declare that all people are sinners, but also it declares that all people need a Savior. As it says in Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, not even one. In verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In chapter 6 and verse 23 of the book of Romans, for the wages of sin is death. You see, here we clearly see that all the world is in desperate need of a Savior because we're all sinners, and that Savior is Jesus. Now, you might disagree with some of those verses that I just quoted. In fact, some might Take offense to the fact that the Bible says you are a sinner. You may think, that, well, that verse, truly, it really doesn't apply to me because I'm a pretty good person. I am, in fact, in my opinion, I am a, a real good person. So you think, I don't really need to be saved. 
But this would be a huge mistake because God's word, it says repeatedly, all people, even good people, are sinful and they are lost without Jesus Christ. Without him, all of us face a life here that is empty of purpose and a death that is without hope. So even if you're not a blatant sinner, you're still not good enough to meet God's standards and to get to heaven. So we all entertain sinful thoughts. We all do things that we shouldn't do or don't do things that we should do. We are all sinners according to the word of God and really the facts speak for themselves, the reality. If we would look into our lives, we would have to agree with what the Bible says. And so someone had to take uh, our sins and do, do something with them. Someone, we needed a savior to take the penalty for our sins on himself and in so doing, he uh, would bridge the gap between God and mankind. Someone that in himself was no sin. Someone who was perfect like Jesus. And according to the word of God, the only being who could do that is Jesus. And that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary. Not because we deserved it, because we truly do not. Not, not because uh, we could earn it and because we cannot earn it but because of his amazing grace. Jesus Christ and only Jesus was able to die for our sins, your sins and mine. So when it comes to salvation, we know it's all about grace. The only way that we can be saved is through the amazing, unfathomable grace of God that is seen clearly on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is indeed an exclusive name. Now let me get to the last point here. It is also an empowering name. Listen to John 14 verses 13 and 14. Here Jesus promises, uh, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, for thousands of years, Christians have done all that God has asked them to do through the power of the name of Jesus Christ. They have learned, like Paul, that we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And that it is, it is Christ in us that enables us to do the will of God on this earth. Empowered by Jesus' name, you think of Christians all through the centuries have been empowered to uh, help the world's poor and the world's hungry. In his name, believers have started help programs like the Red Cross, Easter Seals, the Salvation Army. In his name, the name of Jesus, the modern medicine movement began. Following the example of the great physician, Christians have fueled some of the greatest humanitarian advancements in medicine. In fact, many historic, historians attribute the creation of the hospital to Christianity. Uh, for in the, in the United States, the first hospitals were started by Christians who were relying on the power of the name of Jesus Christ. In the power of his name, the, the greatest universities worldwide were founded by Christians for Christian purposes. They are not now, but Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, and many others. But most of the world's languages were first set to writing by Christian missionaries who were trying to teach people the word of God. And in, in Jesus' name, Christians work for basic human rights that women were not treated like a a possession or an animal. They were treated with equality. In Jesus' name, not only women, but those uh, uh, people of all races and colors were also treated equally. And of course, the greatest example of the power of Jesus' name 
is seen in Christians who, who have relied on him to enable them to take the good news to the uttermost parts of the world. Remember that great commission that God has given to all of us, that Jesus told his followers there in Acts 1.8, Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And they were. In the power of his name, Christians literally turned the world upside down. All hail the power of Jesus' name. That song in itself has been used in the great evangelistic meetings. Reverend E.P. Scott was a missionary to India, and he wrote of trying to reach a, a savage tribe in the Indian subcontinent, ignoring the pleading of his friends who said, don't go, it's very dangerous. He, uh, he went into this territory anyway. Several days later, he met up with a large party of warriors who surrounded him and who had their spears pointed right for his heart. Well, Scott expected to die at any moment. He took out his violin, he breathed a prayer, he closed his eyes, and he began singing, All hail the power of Jesus' name. He sang, as the song clearly states, about Jesus ransoming us all from the fall. He sang about God's grace, and when he reached these words, let every kindred, every tribe, he opened his eyes, and there stood some of those warriors with tears in their eyes. There stood all of those warriors with their, now their spears lowered. Scott spent the next two years evangelizing that people group, telling them all about Jesus. Jesus, who had come to save them. Jesus is indeed an empowering name. At the name of Jesus, demons cower. At the name of Jesus, souls are saved. Praise God. Tonight, if you're not a Christian, then I challenge you to call on the esteemed, the easy, the enduring, the exclusive, and the empowering name of Jesus right now. Pray that simple prayer. Jesus, save me. Admit you're a sinner. Call upon him to save you. And um, um, there is no other name. That name that is above all names. In fact, calling on Jesus' name is not only going to change your life, it will change your eternal destiny. And Christians, oh, let's not be ashamed of the name of Jesus. But let's take it everywhere we go and proclaim it to a lost and dying world. Folks, we are praying for you, and I trust that you'll keep looking up as we are serving the Lord together in these latter days. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for those that have listened to this message. I pray that thy will be done in each and every heart. If there's any unsaved that are listening tonight, may they call upon the name of Jesus to save them. May Christians be encouraged and motivated to take the name of Jesus to this lost and dying world that we find ourselves in today. For we ask this in Jesus' name.